Now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to our next session of the day, which is our panel number four. While we quickly set the stage for the panelists, let me take the time to brief you about this panel with certain points which this upcoming panel of esteemed experts are going to talk about. Role of technology in anti-money laundering and how to prevent financial crime. Some of the pointers of discussion include identifying the latest fraud trends in the banking industry, using data to identify scams proactively without impacting the customer, identifying the types of data leveraged for fraud detection with a specific focus on emerging data sources, use both conventional, traditional and non-traditional data analysis techniques, how to identify anomalies and signs of fraud using audit analysis, how artificial intelligent applications is helping in investigating fraud with unstructured data, improving fraud detection with machine learning and AI, using data analytics and data techniques to detect, prevent suspicious activities and many more. So now, without taking much time of yours, ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome the honorable panel members. Joining us first on the stage, Mr. Nirmal Paul. Senior Vice President, Fraud, Risk and Governance, Bajaj Alliance, Life Insurance. Big round of applause to Nirmal. Welcome to the stage, Nirmal. Please have your seat. Joining next, ladies and gentlemen, on the panel, Mr. Ashish Chandak, Head of Fraud, Risk Management and AML from Yes Bank. Big round of applause to Ashish. Ashish, welcome to the panel. Please have your seat, Ashish. Joining next on the panel, Mr. Kapil Talati, Senior Vice President and Head of Internal Audit and Risk Assurance from Neo Growth Credit. A big round of applause to Kapil. Kapil, welcome to the panel. Please have your seat. Joining next on the panel, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ashish Tripathi, Group Director, Fraud Risk Management, CFCC, Standard Chartered Bank. Big round of applause to Ashish. Ashish, welcome to the panel. Please have your seat. Joining next on the panel, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Natarajan Ramani, Chief Product Officer, TransUnion Civil. Big round of applause to Natarajan Ji. Welcome to the panel. Please have a seat. And now I would like to call on stage our honorable moderator for this panel session, Mr. Kapil Punwani, CRO, Star Health and Allied Insurance. A big round of applause for Kapil. Kapil, welcome to the panel. So Kapil, all over to you. Looking forward to a great session here. Hello, am I audible? Uh, so just just uh, just before we start the panel, I just want to make an announcement that we uh, tweak the questions a bit, you know, to make it a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, just going back to the roots of fraud. Just wanted to understand from the panel uh, because we have a diverse, uh, you know, panel member here. Uh, so we have people from banking, we have people from insurance, uh, people from NBFCs and obviously uh, you know, the bureaus. Just wanted to understand from them also uh, you know, a brief introduction uh, from each one of them as to in your organization, what is the kind of fraud prevention framework you have? How do you identify uh, and prevent and set a very, very strong deterrence in your organization because every organization identifies and ana ana uh, you know, analyzes uh, but how do you set the deterrence uh, you know, so that your fraud is mitigated. So uh, I will start with uh, Nirmal, you want to? Thanks Kapil, uh, I am Nirmal Paul, I head the fraud risk and governance for Vajaj Alliance Life. Uh, I've done my inference already, but uh, uh, professionally completely different uh, work which I'm doing in Bajajali uh, life. You talked about the various uh, fraud strategy which is being used. So in Balak and uh, once we talk about fraud prevention, and uh, I would like to work on this word called prevention, and if I ask somebody how do you prevent somebody to enter your house, the information which will come, yes, I have got uh, huge walls, I have got iron gates and nobody can enter. So that's my strategy on prevention. So I would say prevention itself, it's a, it's a very weak strategy. If you don't allow your frauds to come inside your company, you will never learn how frauds happen. So it is suggested, or what we also do, 
that we keep our doors open for everyone. However, at every stage, every step, you have your CCTV cameras, your scanners available to understand and allow the fraudsters to enter the system, navigate on every step, but stop them at the last stage. So once the fraudsters navigate, it, it leaves a trail, it gives an information, and it also helps in futuristic predictive analytics. If you want to do a futuristic predictive analytics, you need to have a historical data. If fraudsters do not enter the system and they stay away, they will not leave a trail. So all the cases which comes, which is a suspected fraud or potential frauds, they are being rejected in the system so that this information is available with other 25 life insurance companies that this person came with a fraud and which has been stopped. From prevention, the next step which is the utmost important is called deterrence. Which basically means if a fraud has entered in a system, you can't leave him. Many times what happens, employees who have done a fraud, the companies will leave them, ask them to resign and leave on the same day. But if somebody has done a fraud, which is not just a fraud on the organization, but also on the customers, he needs to be terminated. Number one, termination has to be issued to those employees. And if required, if we have evidences in place, we can also go for police complaints and FIRs. And once you do an FIR, it needs to come in the newspaper so that it becomes a difference. So stopping a fraud, allow the fraud to happen, watch the fraud to happen, track him to the last level, and the last level, hang him, and hang him and show to the world, this we have taken action on this fraudsters, so that it become example for others to not to commit a fraud. So that's a strategy which is being used. So removing, moving from prevention, it is the strategy of elimination. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Ashish, from a banking perspective, uh, you deal with frauds day in day out. Uh, how does your organization look at the entire fraud prevention framework? Thanks. Thanks, Kapil. I'm Ashish. Uh, I represent the fraud risk management and the email function at uh, Yes Bank. And uh, interestingly, what we've done at Yes Bank is merged the two uh, units under me. Uh, while I say merged, they still are different units, the fraud risk management area and the AML function. We've gone on the Framel approach. Uh, because as we all understand, the proceeds of the crime, or the crime is the fraud part of it, the proceeds of the crime are being then placed into the economy, layering is done, integration is done within the economy. That is the AML aspect part of it. So one leads to the other and therefore to that extent the entire family approach is what we have uh, moved on to. And to that extent, uh, well, uh, as a bank, we target on both the sides. The asset side as well as the liability side. And most of the times we end up talking of a lot of frauds happening on the asset side. These days there are a lot of frauds happening on the liability side also. And that is what we heard uh, Anurag talking of in his uh, you know, presentation when he talked of the various you know, scams which are happening these days. Those are the scams which are happening on your liability accounts, on your savings accounts or on your current accounts and all. Similarly, the same savings account, current account and all can be used by these agents or the non-state actors, if I may call them so, as the mule uh, accounts to layer the proceeds of the crime through the various parts or through the various accounts so that their identity can be protected and then integrate it finally into the economy. So that is the laundering aspect part of it. So your liability accounts also therefore become prone to such sort of fraud risk, such sort of AML risk that we are talking of. And that is where, taking a cue from where uh, my colleague uh, left uh, the conversation on, uh, prevention activity, and the deterrence activity becomes so very crucial, so very important. Prevention, you uh, don't allow the fraudsters to come in, you prevent it in all form and manner, which would mean that across the customer life cycle, we'll have to look at what are the various prevention measures which can be put in place so that the fraudsters don't come in into the system. It could be at the onboarding stage, it could be ongoing on a transaction monitoring stage, it could be even after the frauds have happened to try and identify the modus operandi, to try and identify what went wrong, 
put that as a feedback loop back into the system so that those modus operandi can at least be plugged so that in the future those things can't happen. So across the customer life cycle we will have to look at things, what we can improve upon from a prevention perspective, investigate and close back the loop. Similarly on the deterrence side there could be other things like, like he said, hang the person publicly so that people take it as a deterrent going forward, it shouldn't happen. The other interesting thing that most of us do including the insurance companies and all are the seeding activity. So when I say the seeding activity, it is like you know you post your own man to try and act as a fraudster or to try and get an account opened with some deficient KYC documents or with certain deficient profiles and all and see if the system allows that to happen. And if the system allows that to happen, somewhere there is a process gap in your system that needs to be plugged. Or else it could be a process lapse also, which means that those people who allow that sort of activity in the seeding uh, thing to go through are liable to get punished and they should be punished. So that is the other different activity so that your staff or your people are always on the toes that there is a hidden entity within the bank who could come and do some sort of a check on us. So prevention, deterrence, then comes the deter uh, detection and the investigation activity also and we will take it up uh, further in the discussion as we come up uh, in the uh, due course. Uh, and the last point that I would like to share uh, thereafter would be how all of us together and not only all of us here, all of us together can make a difference to this space in the larger scheme of things. Sure. Thanks Ashish. Kapil, over to you. Uh, just want to know your thoughts. I mean, you know, some organizations believe in the proactive approach. Some organizations are reactive to fraud. In your organization, what is the framework? Is it reactive or is it reactive and currently and moving to proactive? You want to share your views on that? Thanks. I mean, so, uh, you know, I take it from an industry perspective. So, how NBFC in per se. Uh, have a preventive measures. So NBFC is mostly on the asset side of lending. So most of the frauds is on the asset side of lending, and uh, the prevention measures which uh, you know industry follows right now is the what we have seen is the KYC identity theft, which was one of the top point in your TransUnion uh, civil presentation. Is something is very very big, and especially when somebody is into unsecured lending or into personal loans, individual loans, MSME, these are the frauds which is happening on a continuous basis. So, to, in order to prevent those, so NBFC industry has built uh, preventive steps both at the onboarding stage and post onboarding stage. So, on the uh, pre onboarding stage, if you ask me, then the the technology is very much in use because the data size is very large. So a lot of uh, platforms are available where you can actually match the identity of the borrower. So if you see if my borrower identity matches 100 persons with whatever is available in Aadhaar card or bank card, then for me it's a red flag because I can't have a borrower who has, uh, you know, uh, using one sari with same color is present when the PD was done, when the Aadhaar uh, card was prepared and when the pen card was prepared. So this is a pattern we have seen. On the detection side, uh, uh, post onboarding, uh, how do we identify it is that once we know that you know, one borrower has come and probably even we don't know, then we have every uh, 10 days, if we check uh, you know, early delinquencies, that can give us, then we have a uh, data analytics calls all data analytics where uh, PTP is given by the borrower. The analytics on that, that also gives a lot of information. And the third one is uh, when we see uh, that, you know, uh, early welcome call. So we have seen that when you make call to the customers, 92%, 90% uh, you meet the client, 8 to 10% they call. So this also gives a lot of clue that, you know, one of this could be a fraudsters. And then, we drill down to a particular location, particular branch, particular relationship manager, particular channel of funding to a DSA. This gives a lot of insight uh, to detect the frauds. And it, it, I mean, in fraud, it's a saying, right? Early you detect, 
Thanks, Babu. Uh, Ashish, your thoughts on how robust is the framework at SCV and whether uh, you know, in your organization, naming and shaming is also used as a deterrence because many organizations don't you know, want to go in that direction. Uh, you know, your legal never signs it off saying that you, know, you might get a legal recourse from the terminated employee. So what are thoughts on that? And that's the usual thing, you know. So, but before going to that, uh, my name is Ashish Tripathi. I'm working with the Standard Chartered Bank. I look into the group fraud risk management, where uh, we work along with the global leaders uh, across all the countries and the markets, and we make sure that our fraud risk mitigation mitigation system is uh, well running and in place. Uh, I would touch upon the key aspects which I feel that uh, are the how, how should a fraud risk management network look like? So, for me, it is it is into the day-to-day -day things, how we actually run the business. Uh, the mitigation cannot happen at one layer. It's a layered control framework which needs to work for an organization in order to mitigate the fraud. We might ha have different kind of layers across the system, but ultimately, each layer should work and contribute in order to make a good fraud risk management system. Starting from hiring of the staff members, if you don't hire the right set of staff people, uh, you're not actually preventing it. Uh, if you're not designing your processes well, if you're not putting your controls well in the place, which means at the first place, uh, the design is not sufficient, then comes to the uh, layer of uh, the so-called uh, uh, fraud net, uh, channels which we know that prevention, detection and investigation. Investigation also, how actually investigation is yielding the result for the organization. <clears throat> Whether through the investigation, whatever we learn, are we going to read it across into the similar pattern across all the processes, across all the markets and the businesses? So we learn well and we put systems in place and nothing similar can happen in the future. Similarly, surveillance as a platform, we all have heard about the surveillance platform systems. Do we really use it as a deterrence mechanism? Because any fraudster would think twice before going into the area which offers some kind of resistance. If you know that there is some kind of surveillance available, you will think twice going going down the way. So, to me, it is an overall system, it is an overall framework, it doesn't sit in any one particular layer, rather it's a layered control framework for me. Thank you. Thanks, Ashish. Natarajan, you play a very uh, important role in this entire panel discussion because you are from a bureau. Uh, you know, so every organization has a different framework, every organization has a different uh, you know, outlook towards uh, fraud. But the industry is uh, you know, getting impacted by fraud. Uh, as we speak, you know, we have fraudsters also a way ahead, you know, a step ahead of the organizations. How is the Bureau contributing you know, to prevent frauds holistically? Uh, thanks, Kapil. Uh, now, it's a disadvantage of going last because I think most of my fellow panel members have covered what I was planning to cover. But having said that, what I want to talk about is uh, as a as financial civil, we are honored and privileged to work with most of the financial institutions in the country. And thereby, we, we get to see and get to hear what every institution is practicing from prevention and, and being proactive on the fraud space. Now, uh, I'm going to ask. A, I'm going to ask answer some of the questions. What to ask some of the other panelist members is what is the biggest deterrent, right? Which which organizations apply? I think a lot of organizations today, when a customer is not paying, the biggest deterrent they say is they have a civil score Now that's one of the biggest deterrent as a, as a transunion civil bureau which we play is that because if a fraudster is not paying the loans or if he's committed the fraud his civil score gets impacted and thereby he doesn't get future loan and facilities in any other place where he goes. Uh, 
Now, as Transunion Circle, what is the role which we are playing and how we are actively helping the various organizations? Is obviously, we are coming out, we have multiple products and solutions. We, since entire banking industry reports data to us uh, as, as part of the rule of law, we have a lot of information about every borrower in the country. So, we have mismatch alerts, we have ID verification, we know the same borrower has come and applied with different identity information across multiple institutions, which is what lenders use today to help prevent frauds at the right onboarding stage itself. Uh, the, 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 our thought process in fraud has always been not a process A or a process B works, it's kind of a layered approach which always works and it's not that an organization A is following one approach is right and organization B following another approach is right. It's about keeping on testing and changing, testing and controlling, doing champion challenger always. And that's always been our thought process in the fraud ecosystem uh, to keep going back with multiple solutions with two institutions so that they're able to test and learn and always improve. Thanks, Dr. So moving on, uh, if I can ask Nirmal to pitch in, what are the latest fraud trends you've seen in the insurance space? The latest frauds which we have seen, which is actually, uh, we used to see a lot of cases of policies on dead life, but during the COVID time, since the physical world has become digital and uh, what we heard about uh, digital, and we understood a lot of verification which used to happen physically, they have actually become virtual. Now, fraudster is a person who is the first to adapt to a change. He understood, yes, now these people may not visit the customers physically, they will be looking into the videos. Now, fraudster started creating their own videos. So, they created a video of a person who is about to die, a cancer patient. He has been dressed up well in a suit and the background is also being changed and he gives a video I am absolutely fine, I am looking for a policy and I am from this location and I will take this policy. These videos were circulated to those employees who are on PIP which is Performance Improvement Plan so they are also aware who are the people who are PIP and since they needed a business to continue their employment they took those policies and they became uh, cases of claims coming in in the next six months. That's, that's one thing which has happened. Second thing, they also understood that life insurance business, people are fully aware of red locations, the geographical pockets which have been identified as fraud locations. There are some pin codes which have been clearly, uh, clearly communicated. This could be a fraud location. For example, if I talk about Gujarat, that is Charanagar, Bhavanagar, uh, Kubir Nagar, if Banas Kanta, Savar Kanta, if you talk about uh, Haryana, Jin, if it is uh, Madhya Pradesh, Bhind and Morena. So what they understood, the pin codes have been identified, the location have been identified. Now, what they have done, they have changed the addresses in the Aadhaar card. Now it is very easy to change an address. You go to a new location, you provide an address proof and you can change the location. Now, if somebody is living in Charanagar, which is a negative location, he will not take a policy from Charanagar, he will go to Ahmedabad, he will go to Nagpur, he will go to Nasik and he will change the Aadhaar address and with the new address he will apply for a policy. That's number two. Number three, the latest fraud which is happening in life insurance policy. Today we have an Aadhaar card, we can have it validated with the name, address, date of birth. But can we validate the photograph? Answer is no. So what they have done, now they are changing the photographs in the Aadhaar card. So the customer who has applied for the policy and the person who are, whom you are meeting is completely different. So with the COVID, the cases of impersonation has completely been on rise, where siblings are coming up as customers, where the other sibling is already dead. And they will show, yes, I am the customer, the policies are being taken. The video verification is cleared by the sibling. Even the medicals are being cleared by the sibling and these cases go completely unnoticed unless you have a technology called face recognition. Now face recognition tool can also differentiate between a Siamese twins with the scores which have been given. 
So whenever you use the face recognition technology, and if the score is less than 30, that could be your benchmark, you can choose that. That you can send for investigation to identify cases of impersonation. Having said that, any score which is more than 95 is also a potential fraud. That means somebody has actually clicked a photograph from the photograph itself and it's and created an entity. So these are some frauds which are coming. Now we talked about face recognition. Uh, the fraudsters have actually gone one level up. Now they are coming with deep fakes. So tomorrow we will have cases where uh, deep fakes will take policies and it will become extremely difficult to crack those cases. But again, uh, we all, it's like a Tom Jerry race. We have to be one step ahead of the fraudsters and that's how we evolve and that's how we look forward to eliminate these frauds. Yeah. Thanks. Ashish, uh, from a banking perspective, what are the latest frauds that you're lo looking at and how do you uh, see the fraud uh, industry moving forward and uh, what are the controls that you're putting in? Uh, so Kapil, uh, I'll take from where he left. Once again, Tom and Jerry, correct? You have to be one step ahead of the fraudsters or the mule guys. Uh, the point remains the same. Are we one step ahead of them or it is not that the fraudsters are always one step ahead of the banks or the institutions, the financial institutions. It is the banks and the financial institutions who are one step behind the fraudsters. That is the biggest panache, if I may say so, of our industry, the entire financial services industry. They are not running ahead, we are running behind. And that is where we need to pull up our socks and start looking at ways and means that we can at least start running alongside them, if not ahead of them. We will start running ahead of them also, but let's first take baby steps, start running alongside them. And that is where I would like to continue further with the thought uh, of my collaboration aspect part of it, before I come back to the fraud trends which I uh, am seeing in the industry. Because to my mind, uh, looking at the time also, that was a very important aspect given that all the industry people are present over here, representing either the AML function in their organization or the fraud risk function in their organization. And they can be thought leaders within their own organization also on this aspect. As to how do we all collectively create a collaborative mechanism. Like on the asset side, we understand there is a civil, so to say, so we have the civil bureau score created. We have a fraud registry which is created by the regulator with respect to the central fraud registry where all the frauds are reported and all. Something similar has to be created for these, you know, liability accounts or some sort of suspected accounts where we as, say for example, from the AML space, report these uh, suspicious accounts or suspicious people to the FIU, the regulator. Somewhere a common domain has to get created, a common repository has to get created. Because what is otherwise happening is someone is coming creating mess over there, he's got identified and got reported to FIU, so that account is talked over at this place, he moves in into my place. He works over here for a couple of months, he gets identified, he moves to the third. And by that logic, if we have say 100, 120 scheduled commercial banks, leave aside the cooperative banks, the small finance banks and the payments banks and all the other areas, you know how many number of places they can go to before they actually get stopped. Correct? And by then they would have created another identity, another deep fake, another this thing to create the mess once again. Instead of that, if we had a common repository wherein we could go access that before onboarding a new customer into our system, automatically what would happen is, once he's got identified at any place, at no other place in the entire financial system, we'll be able to create that sort of mess. So uh, we will take this up. I've been in talks on these lines with many of the other people also. So that's called a consortium model, if I may say so. But getting the regulatory, you know, uh, blessings on it is also very critical so that all of us can then officially uh, get access to it and get benefit of it. Otherwise, it will be once again another product created by someone. And then it will be a subscription model. If you subscribe to it, you get the benefit of it. If you don't subscribe to it, you don't get the benefit of it. If my organization shares the data, yes, it becomes more enriched. But if my organization doesn't share the data, it is a still one baby. So to that extent, a thought that I'm seeing here so that all of us can get together and move on it.
Coming back to the point which Kapil uh, made on the fraud trends that we have seen, a couple of modus operandi that I have seen in the recent time that I would just like to share. Uh, one is those immigration scams and all which we have been uh, all witness to. Many of the people in the banking industry would be aware of this. Particularly in the northern region, there are these scams which happen wherein a fixed amount is taken placed as an FD. Against that FD, a relationship statement is created so that person's visa application and all can be created basis that statement. Now, against that FD, a overdraft facility is taken from that bank. What happens? Overdraft is 90% of the money can be taken out as a OD facility. With that 90% money, he goes and places as an FD with for in the name of another person. And now that another person's visa application gets approved basis that. And by that time, again the rotation of the money can start happening by the time this 100 goes down to, trickles down to 10. Again the next rotation can be started because the FD don't need to be continued till the person flies off. So all the visa scams we've uh, seen those happening once again have uh, started erupted happening. One is that. The other interesting one which I uh, have seen recently is where he talked of the Aadhaar mein address change. How easily the address can be changed in Aadhaar and all of that. If those same Aadhaar service centers get compromised, then can you believe what sort of havoc can be done on the entire UIDI system? Those Aadhaar centers are being given on proper scrutiny basis and all of that, but somewhere they are also led by some people only. And they get, you know, uh, cajoled into the fraud uh, aspect and uh, they get compromised. And once they get compromised, they can do anything and everything for some money onto whatever other you want to create, whatever changes you want to do. And the entire system is a uh, is the situation which would happen. The entire UIDI system which is today banking on the Aadhaar is the single proof of identity for all of us as Indians can go for a big sense. So these are two interesting fraud trends that we've seen in recent times which we need to be all wary about and be sure of when we see any such sort of you know, situations happening, take it up to the highest level, do the proper reporting so that the authorities take necessary action. Thanks Ashish. Uh, so Ashish, um, we spoke about the fraud prevention framework moving from reactive to proactive. For organizations to achieve that, you know, what is the role of data analytics and AI? You think, uh, you know, uh, if you want to share with the minutes. So, as we are evolving with the technology, one thing is for sure that we are getting more data elements. Right? Once we have more data, of course, there is always an opportunity to analyze that better. I mentioned before that we put processes, we put controls, and there are monitors through which we measure the efficacy of the controls. But it will not be relevant if we measure those controls effectiveness after a period of time. And here comes the data analysis. So if you have some smart data analysis inbuilt within your systems, of course, you will get to see the triggers, if not the fraud event. Closure to that happening, and hence you will be able to catch that or maybe prevent that. Uh, detect that before it hits the wall and uh, the institution is damaged. But other than the data analytics part, I think I want to talk more about the artificial intelligence, which is which is uh, now in headlines and specifically the generative AI part, which has come to roll in uh, last in late 2022. The moment the new technology comes, all of the institutions, I, I believe this, of course, the technology is the only next thing, you should go for it. All of the institutions are trying to leverage this technology. How can they be more operationally efficient using the artificial intelligence and the generative artificial intelligence? One of the large language models which you all might have heard is the chat GPT. Now, the thing which technology is, it is not, not only allowed for the good people, uh, all the bad actors do also have access to it. I don't know how many of you know, but in November 22, when the chat GPT was launched, soon after, there was another application called Fraud GPT. 
I don't know if any of you have heard, I'm sure many of you would have heard about it. So this is the pace which fraudsters are keeping up with and they are training themselves with the new technological innovations. Earlier the idea was that uh, people used to train themselves or train their juniors to commit fraud. It was a long activity. It is no more. With the help of the generative AI solutions, and I'm just say, talking about probably the bad side of it, people can learn more. There is more attack surface area because of the availability of these Gen AI models and the technology available. The velocity and the volume has completely increased and that we all will see in the due course. Who are making use of it? I categorize them and this is my view of course that there are two types of people who are leveraging on it. One is the external actors, of course, people sitting like uh, in the earlier uh, presentations I have seen Jamtara being quoted. There are several other locations in India and abroad where people are talking uh, about these kind of frauds, right? They are, they are taking advantage of this. Uh, voice cloning, deep fakes, you name anything, it's all being possible and easily possible through this. Sophistication, sophisticated phishing attacks are being uh, done using the generative AI. Again, a, a news reference piece, uh, I'm sure many of you would be aware, in Hong Kong, uh, February early, there was a $25 million fraud event happened. So one of the finance employee was due because using the voice cloning and the deep flake together, that was the first instance globally which we all have heard about. Uh, CFO and CEO and everybody probably in the top organization was on the video call and they instructed the employee to commit the transaction. And it was not in one go, it was in multiple goals. So $25 million is a huge amount, you can all see that. That is the external actor part. Coming to the internal actors, what we all should be more conscious about, more we are going to make use of these technological solutions inside our organization, the possibility of the internal fraudsters, training on those tools, making use of the vulnerabilities in those tools, making use of the data which is being used in those tools, is, goes beyond, I mean, uh, because they have direct access to this. They are training those modules, if you all know that, Generative AI tools like these needs to be trained uh, with different kind of data elements. So if somebody has access to this, if somebody has unauthorized access to this, definitely that internal person is going to be more dangerous for the organization. Coming to the solution part and I'll end my um, uh, statement there. How can we prevent it? Of course, uh, like other technological ways, we think that our fraud management system should be robust enough. We should figure out if there are vulnerabilities in our payment systems. We should also go to the multiple data checkpoints thing because the fraudster, I mean, we are creating resistance for the fraudsters. More data pieces being used, more difficult for the fraud to happen. Then multiple authentication, random authentication, I would say. Typically, we do follow a structure through which the verification is being done and the fraudster once comes to play, they try to follow the similar pattern. But if you are ha having a random thing in place, nothing can beat that. And the last but not the least, using the same tool, generative AI tool, of course, coupled with the human intelligence to make your fraud risk management system better. I think that is the only way, making use of the technology to fight fraud, uh, to make your fraud risk management system better would be the only way to evolve further. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, Natrajan, the last question to you. We spoke about collaboration, which is key to prevent frauds because every organization is impacted in its own way. Uh, what is the, uh, you know, your role with the regulator? Or rather, what is the regulator's role in making uh, this mandatory for all organizations to contribute to the you know the bureau repository so that everyone is benefited. 
Yeah, so uh, very pertinent question, Kabil, and I think Ashish also referred to in terms of the collaboration event, right? So, so as a bureau, obviously we 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 are mandated by the SICRA, the rule of law, to get all the records from every bank, right? But we have to, and we obviously get default history also as part of the submission. But what gets missed out today is obviously the fraud set of information. And today, as we talked about, there are these varied kind of frauds, either in life insurance or in banking or in GI. Uh, and there could be many such more examples here. So th there is there is absolutely a need for a common repository across all the institutions in the country who can continuously report this information to a central repository like a bureau and thereby we are uh, getting this enriched information and that is not only helpful to one lender, it's going to help be helpful to the entire financial industry. Now having said this, just an example, right now obviously there is a lot of data on fraud which gets reports to RBI, which gets reported to multiple institutions, say IIB as well. Even TransUnion Civil has a, has a repository of fraud which is called a detect repository. Now obviously we go out to every lender to start submitting data in this so that each and every lender can benefit from this information. Uh, once I thought this came, it was part of a previous forum a uh, couple of weeks ago, is that what about having a forum wherein just the photos of these frosters are shared, right? Now if, if, if it, the photos of the frosters are shared, it can be easily be done through a face ID matching. That is the same customer come, while he has changed his ID, he's changed his name, he's changed his address. But if the photo is the same, can it throw out a trigger to the banks to help identify and the institutions to help identify some layered approach uh, to these aspects. So it has to be a collaborative effort and as an industry we have to go back to the various regulators. Unfortunately we have different regulators for different financial institutions. We have IRDA, we have RBI. So it, it does make sense for us to go and make a joint representation to all of them for the need of a common repository. I just want to add something on this collaboration part and the regulatory aspects since we are talking about. So, in one word, of course, there's a need of the law, and uh, not one institution, with the thought that not one institution is capable enough alone to fight with this. I want to quote one thing very important here. Uh, again, in the late 2023, UK as a country has come up with a specific legislation which is being called as failure to prevent fraud. It's a legislation. Uh, the final guidance are yet to be ruled out. The most important part of the legislation is the organizations will be held criminally liable if their fraud management framework is not working properly and because of any fraud, if the organization is intended or unintended beneficial. Which means that all, at least in the UK and the, uh, the scope markets, need to pull up socks, need to see how they can strengthen their fraud risk management practices. And I'm very sure, and this is my personal view, that once the UK has come, other markets definitely will follow this. And this kind of legislation is going to hit all over market. So the focus of the government, the focus of the regulation, uh, the regulators in the area is far more than what it was probably earlier. And hence, this is a specific need for the NAR. Thank you. Uh, so I think the key takeaways from this panel discussion is that collaboration is key. Uh, you know, all the uh, industry, uh, you know, uh, companies, uh, different uh, sectors need to come up, you know, need to collaborate and, uh, you know, contribute to the repository so that everyone is benefited. I think the processes and controls in every organization need to be revisited periodically. The controls need to be tested. We need to make our reference checks, background checks more robust and uh, share data within the closed groups, uh, you know, so that the fraud is prevented proactively and not reactively. And I think we, we definitely need to use data analytics and AI today because there's huge data that we're sitting on. So uh, I think these are the key uh, takeaways. So thank you everyone. Thank you to all the members.
Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for this wonderful panel here. Panel number four, role of technology in anti-money laundering and to prevent financial crime. Now, I would request Mr. Gerard from True Sense Root Mobile to kindly come on stage to do the honors of felicitating this wonderful panel of experts. Thank you, Gerard. Welcome on the stage again. We'll start with uh, Mr. Nirmal Paul from Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance Company Limited. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nirmal Paul for his wonderful contribution in the panel session. Moving next to Mr. Ashish Chandak from Yes Bank. A big round of applause to Ashish for his wonderful contribution in the panel. Thank you so much. Moving next to Mr. Kapil Talati from Neo Growth Credit. A big round of applause for Kapil for his wonderful contribution in the panel. Moving next to Ashish Tripathi from Standard Chartered Bank. Big round of applause for Ashish for his wonderful contribution in the panel. Moving next to Mr. Natarajan Ramani from TransUnion Civil. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to Mr. Natarajan Ramani for his wonderful contribution in the panel. Moving next to Mr. Kapil Punwani from Star Health and Allied Insurance and also our honorable moderator for this panel. Thank you, Kapil, for wonderfully moderating the panel. And I would now request the honorable panel members to kindly step forward for a group photo. Try if you could also join them. Kindly step forward, gentlemen. A big round of applause once again, ladies and gentlemen, for this wonderful panel, Board of Technology and Anti-Money Laundering and to prevent financial crime. To all the panel members, 